Well, congregation, at this time, let me invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word uh, to two scripture passages. I added a second passage uh, this evening. Both of them are really on the same page. Turn, first of all, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And uh, if you're using the Pew Bible, you should be able to find that on page 1,112. And after we read a few verses from that chapter, we'll turn to chapter 11. Our topic this evening, using the Heidelberg Catechism, is learning how to rightly participate, how to rightly to participate in the Lord's Supper. And I know we dealt with these verses a little over a year ago when we went through 1 Corinthians. We're going to be using them just to examine what the Catechism tells us about how to rightly to to participate. So first of all, look with me in your copy of God's Word at 1 Corinthians 10, verses 14 through 22. And we read this there, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean that do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And then turn to chapter 11, verse 17, right on the second page if you're using the Pew Bible. Chapter 11, 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant, my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. For anyone who eats eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. When I come, I will give further directions. There ends the reading of God's holy word. And also, I invite you to turn in your forms and prayers book in a pew rack underneath your pew. And uh, this evening, turn first of all to page 232. Page 232. We're going to be looking at four Lord's Days, um, strewn throughout two, or four question answers rather, through two Lord's Days. And we will complete our study of the Lord's Supper this evening. I want to begin at the bottom of page 232, beginning with question answer 
78. As always, I'll read the question, and together as a congregation, we'll respond with the answer. Question 78 asks the following. Do the bread and wine become the real body and blood of Christ? No. No. Just as the water of baptism is not changed into Christ's blood and does not itself wash away sins, but is simply a divine sign and assurance of these things, so too the holy bread of the Lord's Supper does not become the body of Christ itself, even though it is called the body of Christ, in keeping with the nature and language of sacraments. Question 79 asks, Why then does Christ call the bread His body, and the cup His blood, or the new covenant in His blood? And Paul used the words, a participation in Christ's body and blood. Christ has good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that just as bread and wine nourish the temporal body, so too His crucified body and poured out blood are the true food and drink of our souls for eternal life. But more important, He wants to assure us by this visible sign and pledge that we through the Holy Spirit's work, share in His true body and blood. As surely as our mouths receive these holy signs in His remembrance, and that all of His suffering and obedience are as definitely ours as if we personally had suffered and made satisfaction for our sins. And then turn the page. Turn the page to the next page on the bottom. We're going to look at question 81 and 82 as well this evening. Question 81 asks, Who should come to the Lord's table? Those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their remaining weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ, and who also desire more and more to strengthen their faith, and to lead a better life. Hypocrites and those who are unrepentant, however, eat and drink judgment on themselves. And finally, question 82. Should those be admitted to the Lord's Supper who show by what they profess and how they live that they are unbelieving and ungodly? No, that would dishonor God's covenant and bring down God's wrath upon the entire congregation. Therefore, according to the instruction of Christ and His apostles, the Christian church is duty-bound to exclude such people by the official use of the keys of the kingdom until they reform their lives. And that is our confession of faith this evening. And with that, as always, brothers and sisters, let us pray that God the Spirit would bless the hearing of the Word. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, be with us this evening now as we come to the close of this Lord's Day. We pray, Lord, that as you have promised, that there would be a blessing from the hearing of your Word. Grant that blessing now. Grant us understanding. Grant us clarity. Father, grant us conviction from your Word. That as we think on the gift of the sacraments, particularly of the Lord's Supper, Father, give us a right understanding that we would be convicted of its truth and that we would celebrate the gift that it points to, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask this in His name alone. Amen. Well, this evening, as we come to talk about the Lord's Supper, once again, we are coming to talk about a meal. And if you think about it for a moment, if you you think about what a meal is, there's a sense in which a meal can, on the one hand, be a normal, everyday thing, but also, in certain circumstances, a meal can be a quite significant thing. Uh, think, for example, of a husband who takes his wife out for a meal to a restaurant. Uh, you and I would look at that and we'd say, well, that's a fitting thing to do. Because this is a husband with his wife, it is a fitting, it is a proper thing to do for the both of them to sit down at a meal and enjoy that meal together. Uh, if you were the friend of that husband, you would not give a second thought if you were to bump into him and his wife having a meal. It is fitting because of the relationship. 
However, think by way of another analogy, if that same husband were to have a meal alone with another woman who is not his wife, well, would we not all agree that that is significantly out of place? Uh, if you were a friend of that husband and were to bump into him eating this meal with another woman who is not his wife, no doubt you would have second thoughts about what is taking place. The reason for that is, that meal is not simply a meal. And that is all because of the relationship, actually the lack of a relationship between that man and that woman, that it stands as an oddity that he should sit down alone with her for a meal. You see tonight that in some cases, a meal is more than just consuming food with another person. A meal in some cases denotes intimacy. When a husband and wife have a meal, it is fitting because of the relationship, the union that they have. But for a man to sit down with a woman who is not his wife almost always is completely out of place because there is no relationship and that meal is out of place in that circumstance. And you see tonight, that is exactly what the catechism is trying to teach us about the meal of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is an intimate meal that we share with Christ. It is an intimate meal where Christ sits down, as it were, with His people and hosts a meal. It is about intimacy in this relationship. Even more than that, this meal is about intimacy with other believers. In other words, what I'm trying to get at, what the catechism is trying to get at, is that the Lord's Supper requires that there be a relationship between you, the participant, and Christ in order for you to partake of the meal rightly. There is a relationship being shown here, and to rightly partake, there must be a relationship. And as the catechism notes, and we'll note this at the end, if there is no relationship between the participant and Christ, there is a wrong use of the meal. It is not fitting for an unbeliever to partake of this meal. And so with that in mind, we come again to study the Lord's Supper. Last week we looked at the picture of the meal, past, present, and future, on what we are taught in the meal. Tonight I want to look at how believers rightly partake of this meal. And here's the theme that with God's help I hope to show you. We learn tonight that the Lord's Supper is an intimate meal for those in relationship with Christ. The Lord's Supper is an intimate meal for those in relationship with Christ. And there are three aspects of participation I want to show you tonight. First of all, I want to note participation with Christ. Participation with Christ. Secondly, I want to note with you participation with Christians. And then thirdly and finally, participation with consideration. So those three things, participation with Christ, Christians, and then with consideration. So first of all, if you have your copy of God's Word open, look at chapter 10 with me as we note participation with Christ. You note in chapter 10, verses 14 through 22, Paul is bringing up this analogy of how the Lord's Supper is a participation with Christ. And you notice, he brings it up in relation to the bread and wine. Now know with me, in order to understand his argument, note the context is him arguing against idolatry. Look at verse 14. It says, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. In context, Paul is talking about the practice that was going on in the Corinth church where believers were going to temples where there was temple sacrifice taking place and the meal that was being sacrificed was served as part of this service. If you were here a little over a year ago, we walked through the many chapters where Paul is dealing with the nuances of this. But in this chapter, Paul is basically saying to eat that meal in these pagan temples, which was a common occurrence in that culture, Paul says you are participating in nothing less than idolatry. Yes, you're eating food. Yes, you're drinking drink with these people. But since it's a part of a worship service, it is idolatry. Now notice, for Paul to prove that it's idolatry, he brings up the Lord's Supper. Look at verse 16 as he makes his argument. He says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, and here's our word tonight, a participation in the blood of Christ. And is not the bread that we break, and here's that word again, a participation in the body of Christ. Paul says, how do I know that going to these temples and eating this food is idolatry? Well, Paul says, let's think for a minute about, about what we do 
when we have the Lord's Supper. Paul says when we take that bread and when we take that wine and with the Holy Spirit present, there is a spiritual participation with the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Christ, as we partake of that meal. That word there, participation, in the Greek is literally koinonia. Likely that word sounds familiar to you. It is a Greek word for fellowship. It is a word that denotes intimacy, a participation, a oneness between two people. It is really a fellowship kind of between a husband and a wife, the the intimacy and oneness where a husband and wife share everything together. Whatever's going on in the wife's life is going on in the husband's life. There's this koinonia taking place, a participation in life one with another. And Paul is using that language here for what is taking place when the Lord's Supper is served. Notice that Paul says, listen, when you take that wine, there's a spiritual participation, fellowship, that you as the believer is having with the blood of Christ. And when you take that bread, there's a spiritual participation going on where you're participating in this fellowship with the body of Christ. What is Paul getting at? Paul is saying that in that meal with the Spirit present, much of what we saw last week is that there's a spiritual aspect of the meal, that the Spirit is working in our heart's faith and strengthening our faith. It is not mere bread and wine alone that we're taking, but with the Spirit's work and by faith as we partake, we are being united more and more in fellowship with our Savior. And so here's Paul's point. To partake of the meal is significant by faith because Christ is present. And to partake of that meal, the bread and the wine, by true living faith is to be united more and more with the broken body of Christ and the shed blood so that all that Christ did on the cross is reminded of you and applied to you and your faith is strengthened. It is a spiritual meal taking place. We are being united to the work of Christ, reminding us, assuring us that we are washed, we are forgiven, all because of what Christ has done. And now you would say at this point, okay, Paul, I get that. There's there's more to this meal than simply bread and wine. There's a spiritual aspect. But really, Paul, how significant is that? Well, Paul's going to go on to answer that. Notice, as he goes on in his argument, the intimate relationship as you partake of the bread and the wine. Look at verse 19. It says, do I mean then, speaking now of the idolatry, then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be, here's your word, participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than He? See, that's where Paul's going in this argument. Paul is saying, you know how I know you cannot go to these temples and have this meal? You know how I know that? Well, it's not because the idol is anything. I've already told you, an idol is nothing more than wood and stone. But listen, it's a spiritual meal. You're partaking of a worship service, Paul says. And you know what's behind that idolatrous worship service in these pagan temples? It's demon worship. Paul says, it's not just mere meat and bread that you're eating. It's not just mere wine as you go into these temples. It is a spiritual participation of idolatry to demons. And Paul says, think of what happens in the Lord's Supper. Why should you not do these things? Because you are a participant in a better, greater spiritual meal. Paul says, you come to the Lord's table on Sunday, and you partake of spiritual realities with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says, the two are mutually exclusive You cannot have participation with Christ in His body and blood on Sunday, and then Monday through Saturday partake of this bread and wine in these pagan temples. Paul says you would arouse the Lord to jealousy. You see his point here. The meal is a real spiritual fellowship with Christ when we partake. And it excludes, in this context, these unbelievers from their participation in these pagan festivals. Here's Paul's point. Lord's Supper is not simply a meal of bread and wine. If you are partaking by faith, it is a meal that feeds your soul. It is a meal where Christ is present spiritually and you are united more and more as you partake of the meal. It is a significant meal that you partake in. And I would highlight, you notice this idea of participation and fellowship 
denotes, denotes here a spiritual intimacy in the meal. A spiritual oneness with Christ in order to rightly partake. Here's the point the Catechism is trying to make as well tonight. Participation in the Lord's Supper by faith is an intimate spiritual meal with Christ. And you noted the first two question and answers that we read asked that question, well, what do we mean by the body of Christ? What do we mean by the blood of the Lord? And the Catechism rightly said, listen, it's not that this is really the body and blood of the Lord. That's Roman Catholicism. That's what we left. But listen, there's a spiritual aspect of that. That when you take that bread and you take that one and by faith cling to what it promises, there's a spiritual nourishing, a spiritual fellowship that you have. The Holy Spirit is uniting you more and more. So there's an intimate relationship as you partake. But notice, secondly tonight, notice that it's not just a participation with Christ, that's enough. But notice also, secondly, there's a participation with Christians. Again, look at verse 17 of chapter 10. Look at Paul's argument here about believers. He says in verse 17, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Paul's in the middle of talking about the spiritual intimacy with Christ that we have, and then he says, listen, it's not just intimacy that you have with Christ as you come, listen, you have intimacy with your fellow believers. Paul says, think of the imagery. As you come here, there is one loaf of bread, and everyone partakes of that one loaf. Why? Because you are one body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are not separate members doing your own little thing. No, there's intimacy here. You are one with one another. You are brothers and sisters, and the meal points to that. All of this points to intimacy, oneness, that Christians have with one another. Paul's point here is also that they can't partake in the idolatrous practices because it smears their relationship with their fellow believers on Sunday. You are united more and more with brothers and sisters when we come to this table. Now again, we can ask Paul the question, all right, Paul, we get that. We realize that when we come here, we're all members of the church, we're members of Christ, but, but how serious is it, Paul, for it to be actual members? How serious, Paul, should we take the imagery and the spiritual significance of the body of Christ? Well, if you look at chapter 11, Paul says you need to take this very seriously. You notice the reason Paul in chapter 10 brings this up is because of the issue going on in the church that he raises in chapter 11. Now, we read that moments ago, but in verses 17 through 34, the church in Corinth was having a real problem with how they celebrated the Lord's Supper. Look with me at, at those passages just to get a glimpse at this. Look at verse 21, or 20 and 21 of chapter 11. Paul says, When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. The church in Corinth was having a problem. People were showing up for Lord's Supper, and they were not waiting for other people. They were partaking of the meal. They were excluding other people so much so that to their shame, people were actually getting drunk off the wine, and then people were showing up late or being excluded, and they had nothing to eat and nothing to drink. And Paul says, listen, I have no words of encouragement for you. Actually, I have words of rebuke for you. You are abusing the sign and the seal of the Lord's Supper in how you are excluding one another in this meal. In fact, so much so, you notice what Paul says there in verses 20 and 21. Paul says, you're not even taking the Lord's Supper. Because of how you're excluding your fellow brothers and sisters as the body of Christ, you're not even partaking anymore. Christ is not involved in what you are doing because you've abused it so seriously. Now again, how serious is that? Look at verse 27 as Paul gets even sharper with them. Verse 27 says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against what? The body and blood of our Lord. Paul says, listen, you know how serious it is you are mistakenly or misusing the Lord's Supper? If anyone partakes with wrong motives, if anyone partakes while purposely excluding someone else, do you know what you're sinning? You're sinning against Christ. You are sinning against what He did for you. You are flipping on its head the very purpose of the meal. And Paul says this is a grievous sin against which Christ is greatly grieved by. And we could ask the question, okay, Paul, Paul, 
How grieved is Christ by this misuse of the Lord's Supper? Look at your text. Paul tells us. Look at verse 30. Paul goes on and he says, That is why many among you are weak and sick, and listen to this, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Paul says, how serious is Christ taking your misuse of Lord's Supper? Paul says, I know something about you. Some of you are physically sick. Some of you are weak. And listen, I know some of you have fallen asleep. What does Paul mean by falling asleep? That is imagery for dying. Paul is saying, listen, God is so angry by what you're doing in the Lord's Supper. He struck some of you dead over this. You've abused the spiritual meal. You've abused your relationship with your fellow brother or sister through this meal, and God has actually struck some of you dead over your misuse of the Lord's Supper. How serious does God take the spiritual participation with Christians? It was so much so that Christians in Corinth were dying over their abuse and lack of consideration of the body and blood of the Lord. In fact, Paul says, To do this, you are eating and drinking judgment on yourself to not rightly use the Lord's Supper. And so here's the point this evening. In light of this, we learn tonight from the Catechism and Scripture that participation in the Lord's Supper is for those who are in an intimate relationship with the body of Christ. For those who are truly born again, for those who are truly members of the church, for those who are truly united by being filled by the same Spirit. Because that's part of the imagery here. This is a family meal for family only. And we're not to exclude anyone and we're to come together so this imagery of oneness with one another comes as we partake of the one bread. There is a real relationship, spiritual relationship, between brothers and sisters in Christ and we are united more and more every time we come to this table. And that leads us thirdly now tonight. Thirdly, participation with consideration. We could ask a follow-up question now to Paul. Okay, Paul, this is serious. But how are we now to participate in the meal? If all of that is true, and it is, what must I do, Paul, in order to come to this table rightly next Lord's Day? And Paul would say, you must consider by way of self-examination. Look at verses 28 through 29 of chapter 11. Paul says, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Paul says this meal is so significant with participation with Christ. It is so significant with participation with one another that to rightly come, Paul says, you need to take a step back for a moment. You need to examine yourself as an individual. You need to test yourself to see whether you are in the faith before you come to this meal. And that is, by the way, one of the reasons our tradition has the form read the Sunday before, that we would take the week to examine ourselves so that as we come next Lord's Day, there would be a right participation, that we would do exactly what Paul says here. Examine ourselves to see what is going on in our hearts. And interestingly, this is where Heidelberg Catechism Question and Answer 81 helps us with what Paul is talking here about the examination that we should do. Question 81 asked us this evening, who should come to the Lord's table? Or maybe to put it this way, who is permitted to partake of the Lord's Supper? Catechism summarizing Scripture gives four tests of a person that they need to verify before they come. First test, the Catechism noted, is that they are those who are repenting of their sins. Catechism says, in order to rightly come, you need to examine yourself to see whether you are displeased with the sin and displeased with yourself apart from Christ. What what is the first requirement of coming to this meal? It is being convicted of your sin. Seeing yourself as a guilty sinner before God. You are to examine yourself to see whether you are convicted of your sin, despising the sin, and really just seeing how you Lack loving Christ with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and being convicted of that. Second requirement, the Catechism says, in order to partake, you must be one who trusts that your sins are pardoned by Christ. The second requirement is not only that you see your sin, you despise your sin. The second requirement is that you have faith in Christ. That you believe that your sins are forgiven now. That you are declared righteous because Christ has declared you righteous, you see. Third requirement to partake, 
is that you are those who are trusting that your ongoing weakness is covered by Christ's death. That you know you're weak, that you know you're not strong, but Christ has covered that with his blood. Fourth requirement is that you desire more and more to live a better life and strengthen your faith. You are a person who sees your weaknesses but are trusting in Christ and there's this deep-rooted desire to grow in your faith. Those are the requirements, the four requirements, to rightly partake of the Lord's Supper. See, Paul's point here, and the catechism point, it, point is to partake rightly, is to examine to see whether those four things are true of you and me personally. This coming week, as we read this morning from the form, we're to ask ourselves, do I see faith in me? Do I see the fruits of the Spirit in my life? Of course, not perfection. That's why we come. But Christian, Paul says you are to examine yourself. This is a serious meal. We're to see, is there faith? Am I repenting of sin? Am I displeased with sin? Or do I not care that I live like the world? Do I not care that I'm not repenting of sin? Paul says test yourself before you come to this meal to see that you are really walking with Christ in your life. And so we are to have a consideration by way of self-examination before we come. The second thing the Catechism tells us by way of consideration tonight is also that as we come to this meal, there must be a prevention of unrepentant sinners also from joining the meal. Not only are we to examine ourselves, this is a personal thing. The church also must be very vigilant to exclude any who are unbelieving from this meal. The Catechism question and answer, which we'll get into more in the coming weeks with the keys of the kingdom, note that the church is duty-bound, the elders especially, are duty-bound to guard the table from two groups of people. The elders are duty-bound to guard the table, first of all, from unbelievers, people who do not claim to be Christians, those who do not claim Christ as Lord and Savior, must be excluded from this meal. They have no union with Christ. They have no relationship with Christ, and actually, for their own good is why the elders refuse them for the table. If we were to allow unbelievers to partake, it would make a sham of what we are doing, and they would do exactly what Paul warns of. They would eat and drink judgment to themselves. But the second group, the Bible also says, must be guarded, and that is from unrepentant people. People who claim to be Christians, but are living in unrepentant sin. The Bible says you must guard the table because they're, by the fruits of their life, they're living a contradiction. And therefore, the elders will guard the table from any member of the church who lives in unrepentant sin, really for the good of their own soul, to keep them from eating and drinking judgment to themselves. And as the Catechism question and answer notes here, if the church were to permit knowingly such people, it would destroy the meaning of the church, and Christ would not bless the use of the meal. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why the Reformation broke out, why they started requiring church membership in order to partake. Church membership is required in the Bible. Why? Because elders are overseeing the soul of that individual. And so the Reformers began to require membership for the sake of guarding the table, making sure there's a person living in intimacy with Christ, lest the church be harmed and lest that individual eat and drink judgment to themselves. It is one of the reasons why every Lord's Day, We read from this pulpit the four requirements. That is not made up. That comes right from this text. It's because God takes this meal seriously. And Christ has charged the elders with guarding this table for the good of sinners and for the good of the church. And therefore, rightly, the Catechism notes in question answer 82 that there needs to be a prevention of unrepentant sinners from coming to this table. Again, to partake of this meal, meal is so significant Paul is warning that such actions be taken as we partake. And so in conclusion then, what are we to make out of such a a message like this? Two things that I want to briefly leave you with tonight. First of all, what really stood out to me is as we consider the teaching of the Lord's Supper, does this not teach us tonight that as believers, what an undeserved privilege it is to be a Christian? Christian, have you ever thought about that reality about yourself, that you are a privileged person? What a privilege it is to be a Christian. What an undeserved privilege. You and I deserve judgment. We deserve death. We deserve hell. And all undue to us, but all because of what Christ has done on our behalf. He has paid the penalty and has brought us into the faith. And this meal is a reminder what a privileged body we are. We have a relationship with our God. Why? Because Christ has brought us in the family. 
To come to this meal is a reminder of that privilege. I have been bought with a price. Christ has shed his blood for me, and I am welcome to this table. Christian, that is what you are to be reminded of as you come next week to this table. What a privilege it is. I sit at this table because Christ has paved the way for me to be here. That is part of the meal to be reminded there's a relationship. Again, think of the, Im- the analogy we began with. The husband and wife having a meal together. Why? A relationship. Next week we come here because we have a bridegroom who has a relationship with us, has died to bring us in the faith, and all that we do symbolizes that wonderful relationship that we have. It's a privilege. Second thing I think also, and this really probably goes by way of not even mentioning, but we learned tonight that we are to take seriously participating in the Lord's Supper. Paul and Jesus make very clear we are to take this seriously. One of the dangers of taking the meals is to do so flippantly. Just think, well, this is just what we do. It's bread and wine. Paul says, no, it's not simply bread and wine. It's a spiritual meal. It's fellowship with Christ. We're to come knowingly. We're to come participating intelligently, understanding what we are to do. And there's extreme blessing in that. As we do so, Christ has promised to feed our faith, to strengthen the church as we partake of the meal with him. And so believers, as we come to understand what the Lord's Supper really is, we are privileged people because Christ has brought us in. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God and our Heavenly Father, as we think on such weighty things as this tonight, we ask, O Lord, that you would give us understanding from your word. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have been given. We thank you for the death of our Savior who has brought us into this kingdom and to his family. Father, we pray now apply this word to our hearts, give us understanding tonight, and even as we go from here, let us rejoice knowing all that he has done for us. We ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.